Good morning. I want to welcome you to the summer worship service online from the chapel at Ocean Reef. So very glad that you have tuned in this morning. We're going to continue our studies in John's Gospel together from John chapter 2. So if you have a Bible nearby, this would be a good time to go get it and come back as we prepare to join together in worship. But before we do, first, let's pray this prayer together that we pray each week as we say, Lord, help us to see you more clearly in order that we might love you more dearly and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. And now let's join together in worship. Psalm 67, the praise of God by all. May God be gracious to us and bless us. Look on us with favor so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations rejoice and shout with joy for you judge the peoples with fairness and lead the nations on earth. Let the people praise you, Lord. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has produced its harvest. God, our God, bless us. God will bless us. 
and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Our study this morning, it comes from the second half of the second chapter of John. I'm calling this study Trouble on Temple Mount. Listen as I read the scripture or follow along in your Bible, if you will, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others selling, sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market, literally an emporium. The disciples, they remembered it as written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need human testimony about them, for he knew what was in them. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Someone tells the story of getting on a subway in New York City. At the next stop, a young man gets on with three very young, unruly children. They're out of control. And the young man, apparently their father, does nothing to corral their disruptive behavior. Finally, one writer says something to him about his children. The young man, until that moment, has seemingly been indifferent to his children's behavior. He looks up now with red eyes and apologizes to those around him. As he puts his arms around his children, he numbly explains that They've just left the hospital, and his wife, their young mother, has died. You see, context makes all the difference in how we perceive what we see. Had you or I walked onto the Temple Mount in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, of which John speaks, we likely would not have understood what we were seeing. A young Jewish man was causing chaos. His robes were flying, a whip of cords threateningly in his hand, driving livestock toward an exit. Overturning tables as he went, the money changers' stacks of coins were ringing as they bounced across the stone pavement. He was yelling something about his father's house. Well, not knowing the context, perhaps we would have thought the man insane and wondered if he was a danger to himself and to everyone else. But from our text, we learn that the man is Jesus, and knowing who he is makes all the difference in how we see what takes place. This is now the second public appearance of Jesus, according to John, it follows the first, the wedding that took place in Cana in Galilee, far to the north in Israel. This event takes place in Jerusalem, in the temple environs, during one of the three most important Jewish festivals of the year, the Passover. 
The city and the temple would have been teeming, bulging at the seams with Jewish visitors who had come from all over Israel and places beyond, and many non-Jewish God-fearers. They would have come from across the Roman world as well. As John relates what he saw that day, his account breaks down into three parts. First, he tells us about Jesus' anger. And next, he describes Jesus' actions. And finally, he tells us about Jesus' answers to the questions. Most of us, we're far removed from the Jewish roots of Christian faith, and particularly from the practice of Jewish religious life in the first century. This is important in our text because that context helps us understand what we read and hear and what we see in our imagination. Now, this was by no means Jesus' first visit to the temple. His family went every year from the time that he was small. It was their custom. It was their practice, John tells us. You remember the story of Mary and Joseph frantically searching for Jesus when he was 12 years of age? They were already returning to Nazareth when they realized he wasn't with them. They turned around and went back to Jerusalem and spent three days looking for Jesus. And where did they find him? Well, he was sitting in the temple courts talking to the teachers. Mary asked emotionally, Son, why have you treated us like this? And Jesus replied almost casually, it seems, Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Well, what marked this visit from Jesus, all Jesus' other visits, it was something that we came to understand last week at the wedding in Cana when Jesus gently rebuffed his mother Mary. Jesus made it clear to her and to us that he was now living his life according to his heavenly Father's plan and time. And now this was the time to restore his father's intent for worship in the temple, his father's house. Jesus' anger that day, it was not really so much about what he found in the temple as much as it was about where he found it. The buying and selling of cattle, of sheep and doves, that was absolutely necessary for the worship that took place in the temple. You'll recall that many of the offerings that God required of his people involved a sacrifice. The New Testament book of Hebrews, it summarizes the teaching of Torah when it says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And then it says, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Did you recall how Luke's gospel, how it tells us about the time when Mary and Joseph brought the infant Jesus to the temple? Why did they bring him? Luke tells us it was for the purification rites required by the law of Moses. They offered a sacrifice, a sacrifice in keeping with the law of the Lord, a pair of doves. That was the offering, the sacrifice of the poor. Like the livestock and the birds, it was the same with the money changers. Just get a picture of those currency exchange windows in the airports where we travel. The coins that many of the worshipers brought with them, they bore an image of a human ruler or a pagan deity. And these would not have been acceptable offerings made to the God of Israel. So it was a necessity to exchange those coins for others which would be acceptable. So what was the problem? Well, the problem was where all of this was taking place. It was in the court 
of the Gentiles, and it could not have been any more spiritually obtuse. God, you see, desired the worship of non-Jewish people, of Gentiles, and that large core, outer court area of the temple, it was set apart and known as the court of the Gentiles. God had spoken through the prophet Isaiah centuries before, saying, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The word is ethne, meaning Gentiles. Well, on that day of Jesus' visit to the temple, as these non-Jewish worshipers of God attempted to make their way to the place God had provided for their worship, the court of the Gentiles, well, these obtuse Jewish religious leaders had turned it into what Jesus called an emporium, a marketplace. Well, it was about what these Gentiles had to work their way around or what they might step in in order to worship God that aroused the anger of Jesus. You know, it really is a fact of our life experience, isn't it, that we make more sense out of life through the rearview mirror than when we look through the windshield? Well, so it was when Jesus' disciples looked back that they recalled Jesus' passion for God's house, the holy temple, God's dwelling place on earth, and Jesus' passion for that house would be all-consuming. Later, the tempestuous, impulsive disciple of Jesus, Peter, in his more mature years, he wrote saying this, talking about us, he said, you also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house through Jesus Christ. We need to understand that Jesus is just as passionate about us and as zealous for us, his spiritual house, as he was about God's physical house, the holy temple. The religious authorities that day they were demanding an explanation of Jesus' actions. In truth, what they wanted to know wasn't so much what he did, but rather who authorized him to do it. How many, how many times have you or I observed something taking place, something that we knew was wrong, but somehow we didn't find the courage to say something about it? Those are called sins of omissions. Well, I think that most of the Jewish worshipers and leaders, they knew that what was taking place on Temple Mount in the court of the Gentiles, it was an abuse of what God intended. Many of them must have felt guilty, like we do, of not speaking up. So when they saw Jesus' actions, Rather than being offended, maybe a lot of them were ashamed that they or someone else hadn't already attempted to correct what was taking place. These religious leaders, they demanded of Jesus, tell us what signs, what credentials can you show us that give you the right to do these things? What they weren't saying is it certainly didn't come from us. They were, after all, the ones who authorized the abuses. Well, Jesus' answer that day, it really wasn't a justification. It wasn't even an explanation of his actions. It was instead a revelation. It was a revelation of what would take place in his life in the future. Jesus turned to them and he said, tear this temple down, and in three days I will raise it up. And the leaders, they were incredulous. Jesus' statement was beyond their ability to comprehend. They replied, it's taken 46 years to build this temple so far, and it's not finished yet. Sometimes when, when our emotions are on the edge, it can be hard to hear, can't it? really hear what's being said? 
when Jesus replied to these exasperated leaders, he didn't choose to use the word he normally used to talk about all of the temple environs, all the buildings in that great temple complex. Instead, when he spoke of tearing down the temple, he used the word that specifically referred to the most holy place in the temple the place where God dwells. In using that word and not the other, I think Jesus was clearly implying that he himself has become the dwelling place of God on earth. He himself was and is Emmanuel, which means God with us. He was clearly intimating his understanding of what would take place at the end of his life and the climax of his earthly ministry. This temple where God had come and lived among us, his body, it would be destroyed on a cruel Roman cross. But in three days, it would be raised up. Clearly, the leaders that day weren't listening carefully. Even Jesus' own disciples didn't really understand all he meant by what he said. John tells us that it was only by looking back that his first followers and we, that we really understand what Jesus meant that day. There's a wonderful contemporary praise song. The words are, one thing I ask and I would seek to see your beauty to find you in the place your glory dwells. Well, John, in the opening words of the gospel that bears his name, he reminds us where God's glory dwells in the person of Jesus. John said, we've seen his glory. God's glory in the person who was the word and who was with God and who is God. God's glory in the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God's glory in Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews says, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. John tells us that this event at Passover in the temple in Jerusalem, it became one of the many signs which Jesus did and as a result, John says, people believed in his name, Yeshua. But what did they believe? Well, John tells us they started to believe the scriptures, the scriptures of the First Testament that spoke about his coming, the Messiah. John also says they began to believe the words that Jesus had spoken to them, words about himself, Words as we will hear in the weeks to come. Words about the kingdom of God. Words about the truth of who God is and what God is truly like. Yet, there's also an ominous overtone in the conclusion to this trouble on Temple Mount. John tells us that while people were putting their trust in Jesus, Jesus was not putting his trust in them. Why not? John tells us. He said he didn't need human testimony about them. He knew what was in them. So in closing this morning, let me say that as we walk through John's account of the earthly ministry of Jesus, those are the two themes, the two realities that are going to surround his life. There will be people putting their faith and trust in him. And there would be at the same time growing vilification and hatred of Jesus. Why? Because they didn't want what was in them to be exposed to the light, to be seen for what it was and what it is. Those are the same two responses we continue to see toward Jesus today aren't they? Here's the last thing. The one thing they and the one thing we really that no one could ever be is indifferent to Jesus. 
Amen.
together in the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our online worship service from the chapel at Ocean Reef. So grateful that you have tuned in today. And let me remind you that if you're at Ocean Reef through the summer, there is in-person worship that's taking place in the tennis center at the card room at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. So if you're at the reef, we certainly hope you'll attend that service. I hope you'll join us next week. We're going to be thinking about Nick at night when Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. Now, friends, hear this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and fill you with his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless. Have a great week.